Good afternoon. This is Shan Dunn with Altair Global. Welcome and thank you for attending today's webinar, Loaded Up and Trucking, an inside look at corporate move management. Before we get started, I'd like to take a minute to address a few housekeeping items. Altair has submitted this webinar to Worldwide ERC for one CRP recertification credit and also to the Human Resources Certification Institute for one hour of general HR credit. Both ERC and HRCI use a self-service model for submitting credit, and we have included the activity IDs and instructions on how to request credit on the continuing education slide in the presentation handout sent before the webinar. If you did not, if you did not receive this handout, please let us know in the question and answer window, and we'll make sure you receive a copy. And I will also go over that information uh, again briefly at the end of this session. Please be advised that your phones have been muted by our phone system. If you have any questions during the presentation, please submit it in the question and answer window on your screen. We'll try to respond to each question at the end of the session. So on to our topic today, move management. It's undoubtedly the most personal, and you could argue, the most critical element of a mobility program. I'd wager that for most of us on the phone today, our personal goods are more than just things that take up space in our houses or our apartments. They're memories. They're mementos tied to past experiences, and in many ways, one of the key foundational elements that turns a house into a home. Getting them to their destination in one piece can be the difference between an employee perceiving a great, re a great relocation or perceiving a disastrous relocation. With all that said, how much, do you, how much do you know about what actually goes into getting your goods from point A to point B? What regulations govern drivers? What government regulations exist for corporate move management and how do they impact the different facets of it? What's the tariff and how does it impact things? What goes on behind the scenes of this, of this essential service? Jim, Ed Jim Edwards, Altair Global's Senior Vice President of Move Management, wants to help you dig a little deeper into the details that get the wheels moving on your household goods deliveries. As you can see from the slide here, in his role, Jim is responsible for overseeing all aspects of global move management for Altair, including strategy, pricing, negotiations, processes and best practices, Issue, resol issue resolution, and serving as a subject matter expert externally and internally on the topic. He began his mobility career in 1992 and has held other similar high-level supply chain management roles throughout his career. It's my pleasure to hand the mic over to our expert for the day, Jim Edwards. Jim? Thank you very much, uh, Shan. appreciate the uh, introduction. And if we could um, just go to the agenda slide. I, I first of all appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak with you all today about this topic or these topics about this really important aspect of anybody's relocation, specifically the transportation of household goods. The, the purpose of this presentation really is to focus on domestic U.S. relocations, um, but it, it's a very complicated um, history that goes into why things are the way they are today. And I want to look at that a bit. I want to really kind of explore the different aspects of the driver shortage. You all have heard about the driver shortage, I'm sure, for several years. Um, what does that really mean? What are the general labor challenges faced by van lines today? What are potential solutions? And we'll get into those uh, details. Also, I'm going to talk about um, government regulations and what their impact are you know, to this industry specifically. And I think this is an area that is often overlooked, um, but one that definitely impacts service, impacts capacity, and uh, impacts safety, of course, as you, can, as you can imagine. And then a topic that we're all um, very familiar with, no matter really what industry you're associated with, you've got challenges of increasing costs across the board, whether they be labor, which is what most of us probably face, whether it would, whether it's uh, to do with materials of some kind, depending on the industry that you're in, all of these different complex uh, factors that go into running your businesses 
unfortunately, the moving industry is not exempt from those same price pressures. So we're going to talk about uh, how those are impacting the industry on an ongoing basis, what the outlook for those could be. And then we're going to dive into, I think, everybody's favorite topic, the tariff. Um, this is a uh, complicated subject, but I think, um, I, I, I hope that by the end of the presentation, you'll at least have a good historical context for why it is uh, in place, what, you know, what, where did it come from, what are, what are the origins of the tariff as we know it today, and, and really does it exist anymore in, in light of deregulation, and we're going to explore that in greater detail. First of all, I'd like to talk about, um, at a high level, the, the driver shortage and kind of explaining it to you. But I want to talk about it in a broader context, a macroeconomic context, if you will, of the trucking industry. Because I think oftentimes in relocation, you obviously associate trucking industry with simply the shipment of household goods. But that's only a small sliver of what's transported in America. And when you look at the numbers, it's, actually, it's absolutely amazing to me that 80% of all cargo in America is transported by the trucking industry. So think about yellow freight, ABF, Covenant Transport, Old Dominion, um, those types, uh, Schneider is another one. Those types of common carrier, what we call them trucking companies, they're they're hauling about 80% of all of the cargo in America. And that's everything. That's everything you see on your store shelves, whether it's your grocery store, whether it's uh, a furniture store, um, your big box appliance, uh, retail outlets, Costco, whatever the case may be. Trucking is an absolutely essential element to the American economy, um, not just because of the fact that they're uh, that they're transporting so much of our cargo, but think about all of the jobs that are, are tied to that industry, and we'll talk a little bit about that later on. But the driver shortage is something that really is a, a real thing, um, but it's really with respect to household goods, it's real during the summer. Um, those three, three and a half months are really the critical point for the driver shortage, and that's going to go from about mid-May until the end of August for the most part. Um, and we'll get into some more detail there. But currently, the US is short approximately 30,000 drivers. I'll get into some of the reason why we're 30,000 drivers behind later on. But the staggering thing for me is the shortfall is, is projected to be uh, 239,000 by 2022. And that's not that far away. Um, It'll be here before you know it, and uh, this is definitely a problem that needs to be addressed in, in a variety of ways, and again, we'll talk about that. But just to kind of give you a, the rest of the fallout of how cargo has moved across the U.S., you've got 8% by air, 6% by pipeline, uh, only 4% by rail, which I found to be interesting, and 2% by water, so obviously taking advantage of internal uh, waterways uh, throughout the country. So really understanding the shortage is critical because it sets a backdrop for the fact that uh, van lines have to compete in the same market uh, for the talent, their drivers, their general labor, and skilled support services along the way. So customer service representatives, claim specialists, all of those, um, all of those positions have to be staffed, and those van lines are competing against this massive um, industry that's out there and hauling such a huge quantity of our cargo. Just to put some dollars around this, if you, uh, briefly, the, the financial scope, you, there's $726 billion in annual trucking revenue, uh, which is incredible, and it's expected to grow by 75% by uh, 2026. Um, I think all of us wish we had that problem, right, that our revenue would grow by 75% uh, in that short period of time. But it's, it's staggering, really, when you think about the money um, that's spent on hauling. Uh, it's, it's incredible. And the fact that there's 1.3 million trucking companies in the United States with 90% operating fewer than six trucks. So definitely, um, a small market player in a lot of ways. I think this highlights a lot of local um, moving that goes on, uh, even local freight. 
And I, that was a very interesting um, component for me, I think, as I was doing research for this. And 46% is for private um, carriage. So um, think about Amazon, uh, Walmart, those types of things. Those are private trucking uh, entities that they have their own um, fleets dedicated for just their business. So 46% of that is private. And then 54% is for higher trucking. And then, of course, the, the top four. Um, and I don't think this was too surprising or shouldn't be too surprising. UPS, Massive, uh, Hauler, FedEx, as you would expect, J.B. Hunt, and Swift. So uh, about 10% of that revenue come from just uh, those four companies. I want to talk a little bit about the driver statistics because this also plays into the dynamics that have shaped the driver shortage over time. Um, the average age right now for a driver is 49 years old. And 55.5% of those drivers are 45 or older. So, um, and this is specific to household goods, by the way. Um, the average salary is $40,260 a year. So let's take a step back a bit because when you think about the skill set that's required for a household goods driver, it's, it's a very, um, it's, it's almost a unique skill set in that you have to have the technical skills, capabilities of operating the, the van, uh, coordinating a staff because they're responsible for supervision of the loading, the unloading of the truck, and so on. So they're supervising the, the labor that's associated with that particular move. Um, so there's that skill set that goes on. And, and obviously, in the corporate environment, which we all operate in, our clients demand a high level of service. And so there has to be a high level of customer service skill set that, that each driver possesses. They have to be able to communicate effectively with all levels of management, um, in, internal as well as with the clients and customers, transferees. They have to be able to handle family members, spouses, children, etc. And that's not an easy thing to do. You, it's easier, much easier to find somebody who's very skilled in one or two of those areas, but to find somebody who's very skilled in all of those facets of communication and interaction, it's much more difficult than you would imagine. And uh, they all obviously have to be vetted very significantly um, and rigorously, which they are, um, for a variety of reasons. So when you think about that, and then that the average salary is $40,260, um, it's obviously a challenge to attract talent um, to the, the high level of talent that's required for that position. Um, drivers, on average, work 70 hours in an eight-day work week. Um, that's not a typo. It is an eight-day work week uh, before they have a day off. So, and that, of course, uh, compares the 47-hour work week compared to an average American. So there's a lot of time away from home, obviously. Um, and that's been a, an also a big problem in recruiting new drivers to, uh, to the industry. Truck, truck drivers log 432 billion miles annually, uh, which is enough to travel to Pluto and back nearly 25 times. That's an incredible statistic to me. Average long-haul driver, which is defined as somebody who drives 1,000 miles or longer, uh, logs over 100,000 miles annually. And uh, the household goods carriers, when we talk about the employment aspects of it, um, household goods carriers employ over 120,000, almost 123,000 people in the U.S. Um, and only 8.5% of those industry companies employ 100 or more people. So what that really highlights is something that you all probably know. A lot of the household goods moving industry um, is comprised of agents for major van lines and oftentimes those agencies are uh, family-owned businesses. And so they're typically not that large. You know, they may operate 20 trucks or 10 trucks, something like that, that they personally own as a part of that agency. But as a member of a much broader network, of course, in any major van line with an agency structure would fit this mold, uh, they're able to tap into that scalability. So that, that is what gives them their, um, their reach on behalf of their clients. So again, a, um, a, it's an industry that's it's very large, um, but it's dominated by a lot of small uh, industry players.
Now, let's get into some of the meat um, really behind us. So we've kind of set some of the backdrop for why there's a driver shortage during uh, those three and a half months or so, uh, in particular for household goods. But let's, let's talk about the recession because the recession really took a lot of wind out of a lot of companies' sales, and the, the household goods industry was, was, no, um, was no exception to that. We, we all saw a significant decrease in the number, just the transactions of, of corporate relocations. They just uh, really drove demand for household goods down um, and for haulers down. So as a result, many people who were thinking about retiring from the industry, and not just drivers, but skilled labor, support services, and so on, decided at that time, as the industry was really almost dying, um, to, to exit, and they went ahead and, and either retired or they moved on to different, different jobs, different skills that they retrained for and, and moved into different sectors of the economy. So really, you had a massive amount of, of capacity, about 30 34% of the industry's capacity left the mobility industry, and they worked in other more profitable sectors at the time. Um, and that, com that compares to only a 9% decline in general trucking. So remember we talked about um, you know, the 80% of the cargo in America that, that is shipped by trucking. That component of the industry, the common carrier component, decreased by 9%, whereas household goods decreased by 34%. I think a big driver of that, obviously, was the impact of the real estate. Um, uh, proportionally to the recession. So, you know, obviously real estate took a huge hit back at that time. And um, while other industries like the automotive industry or some of the other ones, while they declined, they didn't decline quite as, as badly uh, in some areas um, that, that, ha that housing did. So I think that's what, you know, really explains that to a large degree. Unfortunately, that lost capacity is, has really not returned. Um, there are not people banging on the doors of uh, van lines to, to be drivers, you know, to enter into the industry as drivers. Oftentimes what happens when van lines come and say, hey, we've hired 10 new drivers or 20 new drivers, what's happened is they've just taken them away from other van lines and so they've recruited them away. And um, that's a zero-sum game because there's no net increase in drivers it's in the industry. And so that capacity is still gone. Um, and frankly, other lines of business are simply much more profitable than household goods for the van lines. Office and industrial is a, is a big profit center. You've even got record storage to take advantage of unused warehouse space. And then COD during peak seasons has really um, starting to come back, and we'll talk about that in the economic recovery section. And then also the military continues to be uh, much more profitable for van lines and household goods. As the economy recovered, um, it was an interesting phenomenon because you started to have an increase in COD shipments as the housing market recovered. Um, so while corporate moves were still struggling, and this is you know, at the beginning of the recovery, your CODs were starting to pick up. And, and your COD shipments, just to be clear, those are private individuals paying on their own dime to move. Those were actually increasing. They also pay much more. Um, a much higher profit margin than a corporate relocation does for a van line. So they are, they are sought after um, uh, moves. And during this time, since the corporate moves hadn't recovered yet, those moves were getting uh, put into the system. And, and that's one way that the van lines really were able to um, survive through the, uh, the recession the way that they did. And you've also got, during the peak season, unfortunately, an increase in military relocations, especially during the summer. Um, that is still a time uh, that the military tends to move a majority of their people as well. But then you started to see, as the recovery continued on, corporate relocation started to come back and slowly increasing over time. And so what does all this mean? Well, you've got an increase for the demand of the service, right? So the, the demand increases, but the supply stays the same relative to uh, where it was really during the recession. So, uh, or at the end of the recession, and that is there were, you know, the, many the drivers that retired stayed on the sidelines or, or they're working in other industries or they went into work uh, for common carrier um, companies. Uh, oil refineries for a long time, oil companies for a long time 
were a, were a um, a big competitor to household goods drivers uh, because, or for drivers, because they would simply um, pay twice the rate to have a driver drive a tanker from an oil field to collect the material to a refinery, and that person didn't have to really talk to anybody. All they had to do was drive from point A to point B. They were sleeping at home um, in their own beds virtually every night and making twice as much money, and so there was no incentive for them to come back as the oil industry really started to recover. So there's really still no pipeline for new drivers, and that's just the reality of the situation. Um, and it's important to remember all of these things, I believe, because corporate moves are competing against each other and against every other kind of shipment. And I think that that gets lost a lot of times. So any company that relocates somebody and utilizes household goods um, is competing against every other company that's relocating and utilizing household goods. And what you want to do as a client and what we want to do as an RMC is make our client's business shine. And we want our client's business to be really sought after by the van lines so that they get the better drivers, the better labor, the preferred scheduling, all of those kinds of things. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that in the solution slide later on. And we've also also uh, have had a huge shift in demographics. And this has been really interesting. There's been um, an increase in COD shipments overall as the housing recovered, as I mentioned, but um, a lot of that has been non-homeowners as well. And so um, that's with the millennial uh, uh, generation who they, they own less, they tend to ship less, so our, we see our average weights go down of shipments over time. Um, that's been an increase. That's been an increasing phenomenon, and I think one that'll continue for sure. And then um, the increase in military relocations, that's going to continue, and I think that's actually going to um, to build uh, over the next couple of years in particular. Uh, we'll see how things shake uh, shake out in Washington. But um, for those that saw the president's speech last night, I don't think there was any secret that he's anxious to. Um, to build the military, all the branches of the military, and that's going to create even further demand strains on the household goods shipping industry. All right, thanks a lot, Jim, for that uh, information. Uh, folks, we have a trio of polling questions today to just kind of gauge your experience with different aspects of our topic. I'm going to go ahead and open the first one up for everyone's response. We want to know, to what extent has your corporate relocation volume recovered since the recession ended? Was it 20 percent, 50 percent, zero, oh, excuse me, more than 50 percent, or our mobility volume was not impacted by the recession? We'll give everyone a minute here to vote. All right, folks, give me one minute to pull up our results so we can talk about them. Okay, Jim, it looks like 17% of the audience experienced a 20% recovery. Uh, most are, uh, the majority in this case, 37% of our audience experienced a 50% recovery. 27% of the audience experienced more than a 50% recovery. And then finally, 20% uh, experienced no impact by the recession. So how does that square with your experiences and uh, what you've seen? Well, I, I think it's interesting on a couple of different levels. I think, first of all, we started to see a, a steady um, but measured increase in mobility uh, since the recovery began. And I think also this could play into um, the fact that we are moving more homeowners. I should say more non-homeowners now. So that could be um, impacting the degree to which um, the question was answered. In other words, is it the utilization of household goods, which is really um, the intent of the question, or trying to get at that point of that of that question? So I think it's very interesting, encouraging to see that um, at least 37 percent have recovered at least halfway, and that 27 percent have recovered by more than 50 percent. There's no there's no doubt that I think this also means um, there's still a real estate aspect to this as well. You know the uh, real estate market 
from a price perspective, has definitely recovered in a majority of the, of the nation and in parts of the country, even where I live, here in the Dallas-Fort Worth metroplex, uh, has recovered way above where we were prior to the recession from a price point perspective. But the supply is so limited that it's really hindering mobility as well. And so um, that's put a strain on apartment rents and all of those kinds of things and just availability. So I think it's an interesting kind of a mixed bag um, story, but, uh, but telling nonetheless. All right, thanks a lot, Jim. Let's get the presentation pulled back up for everybody. Uh, looks like now we want to talk about sort of our response, at least what we've done to mitigate some of the driver shorted stuff. So take it away, Jim. Yeah, I think, you know, the most important thing that we've done is, um, one of the most important things that we've done is we re renegotiated new contracts with our network providers. Um, we focused in on a strategic process um, by which instead of just going to a group of van lines and saying, here's all of our volume, you know, get it covered, get it covered, we took a thoughtful approach to this and we, we did analytics behind where are our clients moving people to and from, what are the major traffic lanes, what are the weights of those shipments on average, and then we went to our partners and said, okay, this is what we have. Um, let's put together a network that maximizes the use of your logistics capabilities to maximize the service levels to our clients. In other words, let's play to your strengths instead of just kind of browbeating you, if you will, and trying to get this volume covered. And I think that if you play to your supplier's strengths, then uh, you're much better off and you're in a much better place. And we saw a significant payoff with this. Uh, one of the biggest payoffs that we saw was basically guaranteed coverage um, during the peak season. And let me explain what that means. Um, oftentimes, and in previous lives, you know, we've had situations where you're trying to get moves covered and they can't get covered. And during the busy season, um, that's a challenge. It's always a challenge because typically uh, the biggest enemy during the busy season isn't the move itself, it's the notice of the move. So the biggest, the biggest enemy is a short notice move during the peak season. That's really sets, it really sets up a very difficult situation for all parties involved, the transferee, um, your third party company, your van line, everybody involved is disadvantaged right off of the bat. And, and that's a problem because um, we want to set everybody up for success and to maximize the customer service experience for the transferee. So in the summer of 2016, we had a total of 24 moves that were turned back um, by the van line that we initially booked the move with, only to be immediately reabsorbed by the network. So we had no instances of moves that could not be covered by our network. And that's what our new contract negotiations um, put in place. And we're very happy with that performance. Um, we recognize that 2016 was somewhat of a slower year, perhaps, relative to, to the market or in corporate relocation period. We think 2017 is probably going to be close to where we were last year. Um, but we're well positioned from a network coverage perspective on a national basis to handle an increase in volume. So that's not a problem. And our contracts um, with our van lines have really um, been instrumental in securing that capacity. So it's about locking up capacity on behalf of our customers. It's very important. We've also reduced the number of suppliers to better focus our market power. We want to be more important to fewer suppliers so that we get the attention and the customer service on behalf of our clients. That's, that's critical. And then we want to put a, and we have put a system in place um, to really place our volumes with our highest performing suppliers based solely on our customers' voices. Our transferee surveys are the tool that we use to determine the move distribution for our network. And that's a critical element because we want our best um, suppliers to have more opportunities to succeed. We've done this by putting in a new scorecard process that ranks them. Um, they see where they rank in the network. They don't see who the other players are in the network, but a van line knows if they're number one, two, three, four, et cetera. And there's a very competitive edge to that. They want to improve, so they do deep dives into um, key defects. 
and they look at process improvement and drive that internally, and we hold them accountable to that. Um, and we have restricted volume where needed. We've eliminated suppliers where we've needed to uh, based on quality, and we'll continue to do that. It's a very dynamic process, but it plays well into our strategy. And we've also added new shipping options to better fit our client base. I mentioned earlier, you know, a lot of non-homeowners moving. Some of these folks, they're they're college graduates, you know, they're, they've got a stereo and a Yeti, and that's about it, and that's all they need to move. But we've got things in place for them to accommodate those needs. And, and I know that um, uh, many of our client services people have, have talked about these recently with our clients, and I look forward anytime anybody would like to talk to me about those different options that we have in place other than a traditional van line move. Um, I'm happy to do that. And we again, this is an organic process. We constantly are um, uh, reviewing our strategy on an ongoing basis, and I think that that's key because there's so many things that are changing all of the time. It's not a stagnant environment for us at all. So that's that's important to really remember. All right, thanks a lot, Jim. Kind of uh, piggybacking sort of off uh, that topic, we've got our second polling question. And this question wants to ask wants to ask if your company directs its van line relationships, what are the main factors in its choices? Is it the relationship with one individual booking agent? Is it uh, pricing? Is it the quality and performance of a particular booking agent, or is it other? So we'll give everyone a little bit to vote here, and then we'll discuss what comes up. All right, Jim, our numbers are in. 14% uh, of our audience cited the relationship with a booking agent as a driving force uh, behind the relationship. 17% cited pricing. Far and away, our majority, 59%, was the quality and performance of a particular booking agent, and 21% was other. So uh, once again, how does that compare to your own experience? Well, I, I think it's very interesting, and I think what this shows me is that we have to do a much better job communicating our supplier management uh, to our client base because, you know, with 59% of the respondents saying that's the quality performance of the booking agent, um, we need to really look at communicating how, all of the different things that we do to manage our network um, and, and show that value because really the value that a third-party relocation company brings to a van line, no matter who, what that company is, is that of an aggregator of volume. And um, this plays very well into the van line's uh, logistical structure and setup because when they're busy during the summer, which we all know they're going to be busy, um, they really have all the business that they can that they can handle. But as soon as that busy season ends, they're trying to keep their drivers busy. And that's the value that an RMC brings to the van line because uh, an RMC as, a, as, a, as an aggregator of volume goes to the, to the van lines in October, November, December, January, February and keeps those drivers busy um, because the corporate volume, while it definitely peaks in the summer, no question about it, the more clients we have that are allowing us to utilize their household goods volume in that way, it really um, helps us keep those van lines loyal to us because we're going to give them that volume during the off-peak season. So instead of an individual client giving you know 50 or 100 moves during the off-peak, we may be able to give them 2,000 moves during the off-peak. And that it does make a difference. So um, that along with how, how do we treat that supplier? You know, how, uh, are we easy to do business with and those kinds of things? I think those things are all very important components to it. So definitely um, something that we need to take a look at. All right, thanks a lot, Jim. Moving on, I think uh, we're next we're going to talk about sort of solutions to possibly help with the driver shortage, more general type solutions. 
Yeah, you know, in the first bullet I, I put on there is tongue-in-cheek, uh, move between September and early May. Uh, you know, that's something the van lines always ask me to ask our clients, so <laughs> I want to make good on that commitment. Um, we all know that that's not realistic, right, because the way the school year is in the U.S., it just doesn't lend itself to that type of a moving schedule for most transferees and where they are in their stage in their career, typically. Obviously, there are exceptions to that, um, but that generally is um, the, the best way to, to secure the, the best drivers and the best help or really is to move uh, during the off-peak, but we know that's not realistic. So failing that, it's critically important really to allow the maximum lead time possible. Um, we always ask at least during the, the busy season, two to three week notice. Um, and we know that there are instances where that's just not possible. Things move very quickly for people. You may have somebody out who's in the work, um, the workflow improvement process, approval process for a transferee or a relocation request, whatever the case may be, and, and it doesn't get attended to in time and, and the start date doesn't change. So those things happen. Um, the van line industry is really trying to expand different transportation options. One is the intermodal model, and I'm sure many of you have heard of this, where um, an origin crew goes out to the house at origin, they, and they're from a moving company, you know, uh, the, the, the booking agent typically will arrange all of that, and they, they're in uniform, they're, they're, you know, they're employees, and they pack up the household goods, and they load them on a truck, and they take them to um, a warehouse where a common carrier comes, picks up that shipment, a yellow freight, uh, ABF, whoever it is, and hauls it to the destination agent's warehouse, who then uh, will take that shipment and deliver it at residence. As far as the transferees concern, it's the van line from door to door because that's what they see. But in the middle there is an alternative um, transportation option. So. That's something that um, they've really had to utilize in order to address the growing um, driver shortage during the summer months. This is less of a play during off-peak, obviously, as you would imagine, uh, though it still can be used. It's, uh, it's definitely one of the things that they've seen the most success with in addressing the driver shortage. Another uh, term that you probably hear is crate and freight, and that's where um, basically your household goods are put in wooden vaults or wooden crates and uh, transported by common carrier that way. Similar to intermodal, a little bit different with respect to how it's actually, how the goods are actually handled. Um, and then freight forwarders, international freight forwarders are actually um, diving into the domestic business in a big way. And uh, we've seen that, we've used this solution in some instances, um, but they will basically export wrap the household goods just like it was going on an international shipment and uh, they use international crews to do this, and then they haul them, in some instances, on their own trucks if they have them. If not, then they would use um, either partner agents in the van line industry or they would use um, common carriers as well. But I think it, at the end of the day, it's important to remember there really are no, no shortcuts because it's still about people coming into your home, packing up everything that you own, and loading it in a truck and driving off with it. That, that part of it is never going to change. Um, that's the only way you, that you'll ever have household goods moved. Um, but there are a lot of different options as far as uh, how to address some of those, and, and we've touched on some of them here today. Thanks, Jim. Folks, we have our third and final polling question we'd like to ask you today, and it does discuss these alternative shipping method, methods that Jim just touched on. How receptive is your organization to alternative shipping methods? Is it not receptive, somewhat receptive, very receptive, or unsure? All right, Jim, it looks like when it comes to alternative shipping methods, 15% of our audience was not receptive, 
uh, the majority, 39%, were somewhat receptive. And very close here on the last two, 21% were very receptive and 24% were unsure. So how does that reflect maybe what the industry's seen? Well, it's an interesting split. And I think what you're seeing here is um, exactly what industry players tell me they see. It's a slow adoption uh, to, a lot, to a large extent of alternative shipping methods because they're unsure how it'll impact their cost structure. And um, yeah, again, I'd be happy to, to walk through any client um, through that exercise and show them what it means because it's not comparing apples to apples. It's, very, it's, it's different from a pricing perspective and also a product perspective. Um, so I, I definitely understand some of the hesitancy. Um, and I think that the ones that have, adopt, that have said that they're very receptive have probably gone through that exercise and see the value. And it's something, frankly, that um, really needs to be explored. And I would, you, at the end of the day, it may not be accepted by a specific client, which is, which is understandable. But I think exploring it um, is definitely in, in our client's best interest, for sure. All right, thanks, Jim. Uh, now let's get into the government regulations that are around the driver shortage. Right, and this you know, this is an interesting area. It's one that's often overlooked. I won't spend a ton of time on it because when you think about it, a lot of it's common sense. It's hard because really the goal and the intent behind the government regulations uh, is safety, and it's hard to say, well, I'm not for safety, right? I mean, you obviously, I'm for safety. Everybody uh, wants to be uh, safe, and and uh, it's very very important. And they focus on several things: overall driver fitness. Um, vehicle maintenance, obviously drug and alcohol testing, which we would all want, crash indicators, and service hours. And service hours are really the big rubbing point here in the industry because drivers cannot drive after being on duty for eight consecutive hours with at least a 30-minute break. And But that includes, when you say being on duty, that includes working at the house So um, where, when they're not driving. So it's not as really clear cut is what you would think. And there are different things that go in here that really limit how many hours a driver can actually work. Um, they can't drive after being on duty for 70 hours within eight consecutive days. Uh, and they can't drive after being on duty for 14 consecutive hours. So again, 14 hours is work in the house and so on. Um, and this comes into play because we'll have transferees say, to our consultants, well, I don't understand why it's going to take so long for my household goods to get there because, um, you know, I can drive that distance in two days. Well, you're not under, as a private individual, obviously, the same safety regulations, and so it would be illegal for a truck driver to get to that destination in that period of time. And I just think that that's important for us all to kind of keep in mind. Uh, the other thing, too, that we uh, should talk about are the major cost components. So um, the total cost of operating a tractor trailer uh, today is $180,000. And um, the driver is an independent contractor, which is typically the case is responsible for um, this, this cost. Uh, there are different programs that some van lines have to help with this, but uh, those all have to be paid by the driver at the end of the day things that you know we have to think, uh, think about with our own cars, right, our own, our own personal vehicles. But with a tractor trailer, that expense is obviously magnified. General maintenance, insurance, um, the power unit itself, which is the, the tractor, um, all of the packing material, which tends to go up about 9% a year um, without stop. And then fuel. Uh, fuel, usually, uh, they'll go through 20,500 gallons uh, in a year. This is one area of cost that's been somewhat mitigated in the last year, but we're starting to see that increase. And then also we've seen an 81% worker contribution increase to health insurance. Um, so that's 81% more that the driver has to pay for his own, his own insurance as opposed to the, the company uh, paying that portion. So all of these things kind of compound the fact that your average salary here is still forty thousand dollars and and uh, and a little little bit over forty thousand dollars. So these are price com price components that we're all subject to in some form or fashion. It's important to remember that the van line industry is not exempt at all from these increasing cost pressures.
So I want to talk a little bit about the tariff, having kind of dealt with the driver shortage, a little bit of history there, a little bit of context with that, and hopefully um, you all have a little bit of a better understanding of where we got to where we are with respect to that phenomenon. But then there's this other component to um, to the complexity to add that adds to the complexity of the household goods industry, and that's the tariff. And everybody's heard of the tariff. Nobody's seen the tariff. It's uh, it's one of those mysteries that's uh, kind of lost through the mists of time. But um, it essentially started back in 1887, and um, which is counterintuitive because they really didn't have trucks in 1887. But the Interstate Commerce Commission was created in 1887 primarily in order to provide oversight to the railroads. And that's how this whole thing got started. So the Interstate Commerce Commission um, began as regulating railroads. And then as time went on, uh, the infrastructure of the United States developed and more and more major highways were, were built and the uh, reliance on rail was decreasing. And so you had the Motor Carrier Act of 1935 uh, passed by Congress, which placed the industry's uh, regulation under the ICC. So it started as a railroad component. And then with the Motor Carrier Act, you've got still the ICC in place and regulating the trucking industry. So they regulated new entry into the, mar into the industry. They regulated the rates and specific routes. In other words, who could actually service those routes. And the goal was to protect the carrier shipping at a rel because it was a relatively new industry. So they wanted to protect it and, and grow it over time. In 1948, the reed Bullwinkle Act pat was passed by Congress. And that established this thing called a rate bureau. And this is actually a fascinating thing. This rate bureau was comprised of, of um, common carriers or, or haulers operating under the ICC. So they had oversight by the ICC, but the rate bureaus themselves actually, actually set collective rates um, and were not subject to antitrust laws. So think about a group of people in a room from, from competitors. They're all competitors, and they're all deciding what their pricing is going to be. That's very unusual in today's environment. You know, we would never even think of something like that. But that's exactly what was done. Um, back in the late 40s or in through the 50s and 60s. And that was the established, perfectly legal way um, that rates were, um, were, were derived. And they were subject to regular, regulatory challenge, but not actually, um, not actually in the context of being overridden. So they could be challenged in that. You could say, well, we need to ensure that these are fair rates, and you need to make sure that you can communicate to us how they are fair. Well, they would always come up with a way to do that, and, and the rates were typically approved um, and not, not challenged significantly. So again, as the national highway infrastructure was developed, so on carriers became more financially stable and stronger economically and more powerful, and they became less dependent on the rail lines. And the Carter administration actually um, began uh, wanting to deregulate the uh, this industry um, back in the late 70s. And, but it wasn't until the Motor Carrier Act um, of 1980 was passed that really started to reduce the scope of the Rate Bureau's antitrust immunity. And that's really key, because once you eliminate the Rate Bureau's antitrust immunity, um, it created a more of an open market for pricing. And you started having more and more advocates for industry competition. And so finally, in 1995, um, the ICC was abolished altogether. Once that happened in 96, the, the Surface Transportation Board, or the STB, was established. And um, they were really given oversight of the, over the rate bureaus at that time, the ind independent board within the US Department of Transportation. But effective on January 1, 2008, the STB decided not to renew any of the immunity for the rate bureaus. So they basically, at that point in time, ended economic regulation of the industry and really eliminated what was then the 400N tariff. Now, what does that really mean, that the 400N was abolished? Well, technically what it means is that the rate bureaus no longer governed it. They can no longer set it. 
but the rate, but the tariff itself has rules that are self-perpetuating. So it just kind of goes on. It continues to live this life. Um, but n what happened was there was immediate discounting on that 400 in tariff because of competition started. So van lines started to um, deeply discount the tariff. So if the tariff rate was $100 for whatever the item may be, they would start coming off of that $100 and, and, and figure out ways to deliver that. And, and then uh, you had van lines develop their own tariffs. And we still have these, th these tariffs are in place today, but not a lot of clients use them. And the reason is because they're not consistent across van lines. So if you have a client that's buying this service from multiple van lines, it's much more difficult for them to assess, am I getting the same price or the same value from each van line? Because the van lines develop their tariffs independently. They lump things together, together differently, and, and it's just not apples to apples. So it's very difficult to compare them across the van lines. And frankly, the clients are, were hesitant to adopt it because they're really unfamiliar with the differences to the 400N. If I'm going to use, you know, what's the difference between the UVL01 and the 400N? You know, I mean, it's, it, that's a complicated thing. And how does that translate into what discount I'm getting off of the 400N today? So we're seeing a lot of different things. You know, we're seeing for ease of audit uh, an increase in single factor rates rate contracts. We've actually started exploring this with a couple of major suppliers within our network as an option for us to buy from because of the ease of audit. Um, you know, it's basically a door-to-door -door rate and um, the price is the price. So it helps you forecast costs, I think, much better. Um, and then a, a lot of, there's also a lot of alternative pricing because um, that's it, not tied directly to the 400 in, and that's simply better suited to accommodate the alternative transportation methods that I mentioned earlier in the presentation. Those types of the crate and freight, and sometimes the intermodal, and definitely the international freight forwarder model, are not conducive at all to the 400 in. They they just don't work um, in that pricing structure. So we're starting to see unique um, single factor rate tariffs that really address those alternative transportation methods. What's going to happen? What do we see coming down the pike? I mean, honestly, I see um, a continually improving economy driving up price pressure. Um, and this is where our contracts with our suppliers come into play to help mitigate this. Um, we And our new contracts that we renegotiated uh, last year, end of 2015 and, and into last year, um, will help us with that. Um, there's going to be a continued tightening in the labor market. We see it already. Um, there's starting to be an upward pressure on, on wages uh, more consistently. This impacts trucking as well. It's not unique to the service industry by any stretch. Um, I do think that we're going to start to see an increase in the single factor rates uh, contracts for the, two per, for the two reasons I mentioned earlier, um, the ease of audit and the forecasting costs. And then also the point-to-point -point pricing, which is used for your more crate and freight um, options uh, or the intermodal components as well. I think those will become more and more popular because I think that the price pressure under the 400N will be just too significant. And it just won't match up with how the van lines are having to develop new products in order to um, meet the growing supplier shortage, which we highlighted is going to be pretty significant. Significant today, it's even going to be worse by 2027. Um, so I think that those are all things that we need to keep in the forefront, and those are those are the things that that keep me up tonight, at, at least. All right, thanks a lot, Jim. That was a great presentation. <clears throat> Excuse me, folks. Uh, we do have questions, and I definitely want to get to them in our remaining uh, looks like remaining five minutes here. But I just want to touch on our continuing education credits one more time. Uh, here are the activity numbers and credit submission instructions for both Worldwide ERC and HRCI. Uh, Worldwide ERC has already uh, gave the approval for this program, so you should be able to apply for credit right away. And because Altair applied for pre-approval, you should be not you should not be assessed a charge when submitting for your credit. HRCI, we have submitted for credit, but sometimes they can be a little slow to approve. Um, so we are still pending. 
they give themselves up to four weeks to approve a program for credit. So I would recommend uh, letting that four-week window pass before submitting because they may not have worked our program through their system yet. Okay, that said, uh, let's get to some questions in our last few minutes. Let's open the window here. Oh, Jim, okay, this is a good one, I think. Has the industry seen a higher risk for damage with alternative shipping methods? No, actually it's been interesting. The, um, the handling is typically can be less. And what I mean by that, especially with Creighton Freight and the international freight forwarding model, those shipments are, are packed virtually identical to if you were to put those household goods um, shipments on a, sh on a steamship and, and shipped across the, the Atlantic. I mean, so they, they're packed. Um, in many instances, not in all instances, but in many instances with um, international crews that are trained differently. So I think that that's helped reduce uh, damage. Um, and that is a, it is a very good question, though. Um, and But we have not seen any correlation between any of the alternative shipping methods that we've used so far in a higher increase in household goods damage. All right, thanks a lot, Jim. Okay, this audience member uh, wants, I guess, some more examples of uh, alternative shipping options. So I guess even if there are shipping options on top of the intermodal and the freight forwarding and the crate and freight, what other options are out there on top of those three? Yeah, there's a, um, there's a service that we launched uh, recently called sendmybag.com, and it's literally, uh, it's excellent potentially an excellent solution for interns, for um, college grads that really have, as I mentioned before, a stereo and a Yeti. I mean, something that's just really um, inconsequential and, and, you know, as far as quantity goes, not as important to them. That's something that we've, that we've launched. And then we've also launched through um, uh, ARPAN van lines, uh, ARPAN PAC, which is a um, it's a type of a um, crate and freight service that is geared towards smaller shipments. Um, that's a good one. And we're also, and I'm not prepared to make an announcement yet, but we are in uh, negotiations with another company that is unique in how they structure um, the driver and truck component. And I, I'll leave that as a teaser. There's going to be more to come on that. I think it's going to be a great alternative in many instances uh, for our transferees, but we're just not quite ready to, to make a full-blown announcement there yet. All right. Thanks a lot, Jim. Okay, folks, by my clock, we're coming up on a minute to a couple of minutes from close of the webinar. So since we do value your time, uh, we don't want to keep you past the hour. We've obviously had a lot of interesting information to discuss today. I know that we still have some questions that uh, have come in or came in while we were addressing the ones that we addressed. So any of those that we weren't able to get to will be tracked by GoToWebinar and uh, I can get those over to Jim and get a written response out to the audience. And I'd like to close by especially thanking Jim for doing the research and compiling the information and taking the time to join us and share his, uh, share his take and his insight on what I think is valuable information about a valuable service. My pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity. You're welcome. We recognize that your time is valuable here at Altair Global. So from all of us here, thank you for attending and have a great rest of your day. Goodbye.